You know, I was blessed, and I hope you were blessed by the week of prayer, and um, especially the emphasis on prayer. And in my own life, I have been really, before the week of prayer began, God has just been impressing my heart with the need, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and so I went, to, I went to AudioVerse, and I typed in prayer, and I downloaded everything I could find of sermons on, on prayer. Because I was just impressed with the need and the importance of prayer, and I wanted a deeper prayer life. And I, th I wonder if you could ask Christians as a whole or anybody and said, are you satisfied with your prayer life? I don't know about you, but I would have to answer that I wished I, I want a deeper prayer life. I'm not satisfied with it. I want something more. And I think that that would probably be the experience of the majority of Christians. They know they should. I know I should. And I do, but I often feel like there's something lacking, like maybe there's a deeper walk with the Lord that I don't have, that I wished I had, and I want this experience. And we have this incredible statement that tells us this thing here. It says, the greatest blessing that God can give to man is, what do you think? The greatest blessing that God can give. If you ask God to bless you, which our prayers often do, don't they? They often are like, you know, bless so-and-so and bless so-and-so and bless so-and-so and bless so-and-so and bless so-and-so. And oh, by the way, bless me. And What is the greatest blessing that God can give you? Service? Fellowship with Christ and his suffering is the most weighty trust and highest honor. The Bible says, I mean, the Desire of Ages says, that is true. Any other guesses or thoughts? What is the greatest blessing that God could give you? If he wanted to give you a blessing, there's nothing greater. And that word greatest says, I don't know. I mean, sometimes when I read the Spirit of Prophecy, I'll say, you know, she'll say a couple greatest. Can there be more than one greatest? Maybe in different contexts there can, or maybe at different times in our lives there can, and maybe in different walks in our experience there can, because sometimes she'll say the greatest is this and the greatest is that. And I was like, wait a second, there's two greatest there. <laughs> and they're both really related, really, probably. They're both somehow, if we could delineate them together, we could say that, hey, they're the same thing. There's just different aspects. It's like looking through um, a culvert. And there's a gift in the middle. And you're look, somebody's looking at this side and seeing one, one thing. And somebody's looking at this side and seeing another. And they're looking at the same thing, but the perspective is totally different. And I don't know, maybe there's two different greatest. But what do you think is the greatest? In this context, notice what we are told. The greatest blessing that God can give man is the spirit of earnest prayer. Wow. I mean, to me, that was like, wow, I need that more. Because if God's going to bless me, if, he, if I want him to bless me, there's no greater gift than he can give than to give me the spirit of earnest prayer. And I need that. I know I need that in my life. Now, to open your Bibles to, um, to Matthew chapter 7, because here we find some of the most sobering words in Scripture, at least sobering to me, because, you know, it is possible to be a minister, to be a preacher, it is possible to be a student at Washita Hills, a staff at Washita Hills. It is possible to be a, a, a vegan, a, a, a conservative, skirt-wearing Christian at, at Washita Hills, and yet, possibly, this text gives us something sober to think about. Card-carrying Seventh-day Adventists, what does it say here when Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount and he talks to his people he's giving a message and he's talking to his church and he says in verse 21 not everyone who says to me lord lord shall do what enter the kingdom of heaven these are his people that are calling him lord but he who does the will of my father in heaven but many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in your name have we not cast out demons didn't we go to washington hills didn't we preach didn't we wear didn't we dress didn't we eat didn't we didn't we? And so this text, like, sometimes haunts me because it's like, verse 23 says, then I will declare to them, what? It's not that he declares, I knew you, and then you walked away. <laughs> he says, I never knew you. That our religious experience can be such that we think we're following God and we think we're doing all the right things. We're actually working for him. We're preaching. We're talking. We're, we're sharing him with others. But somehow in our religious experience, we have fallen short. And 
He says, I don't know you. I mean, what worse experience could a person have than to get to the last days and Jesus coming? And it's like, wait, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Jesus is coming. And then he says, wait a second. I don't know you. And we're left. And, and there's weeping and gnashing and teeth. Can you imagine? I mean, what worse experience can there be? And so it's sobering because this text tells us that we have to make sure our foundation is sure, is built on Jesus, and he is exalted and lifted up in our lives. Can you just bow your heads as we again pray? Father in heaven, we want to pray that you would be exalted and lifted up here tonight and that you would speak to us from your word. You would encourage our hearts. You would draw us into a deeper religious relations from you and give us a thirst for the greatest blessing that you can give any man, any woman, I pray. Speak. May you be exalted, lifted up, and heard this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, do you want power in your life? You know, we usually think of power. It comes in on wires, and we turn on the lights without thinking about all that, the, all that it takes to give us power. The enormous infrastructure and, the, and, and all of the, uh, the people that are working to provide what we have when we turn it on. And yet it makes such a difference in our life. When power goes out, what happens? Life comes to a standstill. I mean, <laughs> you know, occasionally we're in, the cat, we're in the office and the power goes out and everybody suddenly has nothing to do. Because <laughs> the computers don't work and the lights are out and we're all like, oh, what do we do? We get out the paper and we start working on other things. And we just can't wait to get back on and finish what we were doing on because we need power for everything. Power is essential in our lives. And our Christian experience power is, 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 is so essential that we must have it. Now listen to this statement. It says, prayer is the breath of the soul, the secret of spiritual what? If we want power in our spiritual lives, it has to be based on one thing, prayer. And I need a deeper experience in prayer. That's what I'm seeking. And I want to, and my goal tonight is that with you, I will hope that together we will seek for a deeper experience and the greatest blessing that God can give us. A deeper experience in prayer. I think it was begun. We have to fan it. We have to feed it in our lives. And it says this, no other means of grace can be substituted and the health of the soul can be preserved. That means that reading this cannot substitute for preserving the health of your soul through prayer. Is this important? Yes, but what is more important? At least according to that, prayer is. I was thinking about Jesus. Did Jesus pray a lot? He prayed all the time. I mean, it talks about him. He went out early in the morning, a great while before dawn. In, in Mark chapter 1, verse 36, I think it is, he said a great while before dawn, he went out to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Before he resurrected Lazarus, he prayed all night. Before he um, gave the 70s, the, 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 you know, a, a, ordained the 70 to go out and preach, he prayed all night. Before Gethsemane, uh, the, the cross, he prayed twice that all night, that last week of his life, before he was, he was up all the night before he died on the cross. He, was, he prayed all night. He, would be, he was a praying man, and he didn't, he didn't have the sins and the problems that we have. But how many times in Scripture is recorded that Jesus studied the Bible? Can you think of any? There's one time when he re read the scriptures when he was in the synagogue and he stood up and he started reading from Isaiah 61, I think it was, when he was, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach. So he knew his Bible and we are told in the Spirit of Prophecy that he studied it at least when he was young and he knew it so well that in his life he, he quoted it and preached it. But in his active ministry, in the three and a half years of his active ministry, I could not come up with a single time when Jesus was recorded out Studying the Bible in the early hours of the morning. But what was he doing? He was in prayer. He was a praying man and he prayed, prayed, prayed out often. I was like, hmm. You know, when I get up in the morning, I, I, don't, I love studying God's word. I, I just love it because it's like, wow, I'm learning something. I'm spirit of prophecy. I'm reading. I'm studying. And then I have five minutes of prayer. 
go about my day. I'm beginning to think maybe I have things backwards. That I need to spend... <laughs> it's easy for me to study and, and, and read, but it's much harder for me to pray. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but you pray and the next day you get up and you pray and it's like, okay, Lord, I have the same thing to pray again today. <laughs> Just take my prayer yesterday and d- ditto. Because, I mean, our prayers are some often routine, and they, we pray about the same things over and over, and, and we are told we should be persistent in them, right? And that we should pray, but we, I need a deeper experience. And it says this, prayer brings the heart into immediate contact with the wellspring of life and strengthens the sinew and muscle of the religious experience. Neglect prayer, the exercise of prayer, or engage in prayer, what? What's the word spasmodically? Just, yeah, there's a spasm, Uh, Just occasionally, as now and then seems convenient, and you lose your hold on God, the spiritual faculties lose their vitality, and the religious experience lacks health and vigor. Now, I I wonder, you know, if God were to gauge our experience. In fact, we are told that uh, the Spirit of Prophecy says, I would be, oh, what was the word she used? I don't have the quote in there, but she said, I would be remiss. That wasn't the word she uses. Um... I do have the quote here in my notes. Um, if, if I were to call, uh, let me find it if I can, um, because it, it, it was like, ouch, ouch, that is, that is indeed a, uh, maybe I have it in my notes, maybe I don't. Um, uh, maybe I don't. She said, I would be remiss if I were to call a person who neglects prayer a Christian. If we don't pray, we're not a Christian. And if God could great gauge our Christian experience based on how much, how fervently, and what our, Christ, our, our prayer life was like, where would we engage? <laughs> where would we fall when it came to uh, our, our experience with God and our, our true walk? And, you know... If you know Jesus, if you know him, you have to talk with him. And so does it make sense that when Jesus comes back and he says to a group of people, I don't know you, why? Because they haven't talked to him. Does that make sense? Because when you get to know somebody, I mean, do you think you would ever consider marrying somebody you'd never talked to? I mean, not even communicated with, like an email, text, or anything. I mean, because, but yet, what, what happens when you fall in love? I mean, people love to talk, and not, not, not you know, talking is, God, I'm so glad God gave us the ability of words. We're not animals. We're not just we're running on instincts. We don't have, you know, smells and, and clicks and quacks and chirps to communicate. <laughs> Barks. How would you like that? Oh, we can, woof, you know, and that's all we can do. <laughs> that's what animals can do. And God gave us this capacity of communication of words that we can talk and we can express ourselves and we can be understood and known. Does that make sense? That God gave us this capability and as a result, he expects us to use it with him. And that's his greatest delight that we come and we find delight in communing with him. And so it makes sense to me if he says, I don't know you, it's because we haven't gotten to know him. We haven't gotten to talk with him, to understand him and communicate with him. Now, I just want to, this evening, look at two things that might help you, that have helped me, is help, are helping me to have a deeper walk and experience with prayer. Practical things that, from the Bible, that can enhance perhaps, or at least I have found, to enhance my prayer life. Okay, so we're looking at how many? It'll probably be more than two, but we'll start there. (laughs) Okay, Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. Luke 11 and verse 1. Now Jesus here in in Luke, he's praying. Again, as he often has, he got up a great while. He, in fact, we are told actually that he had been away from his disciples for a while. I don't know how long that meant, but um, he was away. Luke 11, verse 1. And it says this, And now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, 
when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. This verse tells us that prayer can be taught. True? Does that also mean that prayer can be learned? It must. And if you want to have a deeper experience, you have to go to Jesus and find out how to have it because it can be caught, it can be learned. And if we don't have it, we can learn how. Now, as the Desire of Ages records the experience of here, the disciples, they, Jesus had been away from them. In fact, I think I have that in the next year. It says, Christ's disciples were much impressed by his prayers and by his habit of communion with God. One day, after a short absence from their Lord, they found his, uh, him absorbed in supplication. So it was like they were looking for Jesus, and, you know, they woke up. I can imagine they're sleeping out in the ground or sleeping in Peter's house or something, and, and they woke up, and it's early in the morning, and they look around, and the spot where Jesus was was gone, as it always was <laughs> when they woke up, probably. Because he was gone, and they knew where to go to find him. Where was he? A certain place, but it was out and away. It was a secluded place. And so the disciples, oh, no, let's go find Jesus. And so they get up and they go, and sure enough, oh, there he is, he's over there. And as they walk towards him, they start walking slower and slower and slower. And they're just listening. And pretty soon, they're real close to him, but they're all just and it says that they found him in this absorbed in supplication, seeming unconscious of their presence. He continued praying what? Aloud. Aloud. His, the heart of the disciples were deeply moved, and as he ceased praying, they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. And so here they were. they were. They were amazed at this prayer, that this prayer man prayed like nobody else. And I ask you, if people heard you praying by your bed in the morning, would they come up to you and say, teach me to pray? Hmm. Are my prayers earnest enough and exciting enough and powerful enough that people would say, I want to pray like that. Can you teach me how? I don't know. I want that though, do you? Do you want the greatest gift, the greatest blessing? I want that because Jesus, and, and so it can be taught, it, but I want you to notice this that Jesus is by himself and he doesn't even know the disciples are with him. He doesn't know that they're listening. But how is he praying? He's praying out loud. Now, how did the disciples know that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? We are told he went a little distance from them, not so far, that, but they could both see and what? Hear him. And he cried out and he prayed what? And said, my father, forgive them. How did they know that? I mean, he said, he said, let this cup pass me, right? <laughs> let this cup pass, except I drink it, then nevertheless thy will be done. How do they know? Because they heard. Why? Because Jesus was praying out loud. If you study prayer in the Bible, it is almost universally out loud. Now, I don't know. I know the, the prayers, there were a few places in the Bible where, the, where it is recorded that they prayed within themselves. And certainly God reads our thought and he knows them. But I have found a trouble in my life that when I pray in my thoughts, my thoughts take over my prayers. And they're not thoughts of prayer. <laughs> they're thoughts of this and that and all over stuff. And I've gone all the way around Robin Hood's barn and I'm back again. I'm, oh, I'm praying. Is that an experience for you? It is for me. And here we find that Jesus prayed out loud. You can, there's lots of examples in Scripture where Jesus says, where the Bible records that, it, that they prayed out loud. And I have found it very helpful in my Christian life to actually pray out loud where I can hear it with my ears because I found that what my mouth says affects, when I hear it, it affects what I believe. Do you know that? That what you say with your mouth comes out of your heart. But it is also true that what you say with your mouth affects your heart. 
And when you say, Lord, I want it, and your ears hear it, and you say, Lord, please give me your spirit, it increases the desire and the capacity of the heart to want it and receive it. And so I would encourage you, if you want a deeper experience with God in prayer, find a place where you can pray out loud. Now, it doesn't have to be loud that other people, and some people will say you shouldn't ever, in fact, I heard one message on, on Audioverse, because <laughs> one message on there was like, never pray out loud because the devil will hear your prayers and then he'll go to work to counter them. <laughs> and then I heard another message that said, pray out loud. Jesus prayed out loud. I was like, so what do you do? Do you think that the devil would hear your prayers if you prayed out loud? Yes, he will, but do you know what the Bible says? In fact, I, I think I have this. What does it say? At the what? At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. So when you pray out loud, what does the devil do? <laughs> he trembles. And he's hightailing it out of there. <laughs> if you're not praying out loud, he doesn't tremble because he can't hear it. Maybe it's a good thing for the devil to hear your prayers. Do you think that if you prayed earnestly enough and sincerely enough and the devil heard the prayer that the Lord is going to allow the devil to work so that that prayer is not answered? Absolutely not. If you're praying, we are told that if you find voice and time to pray, God will find voice and time to answer. <laughs> he will answer those prayers. And so don't worry about it, the devil. God can take care of him. You just pray to God and you pray out loud if you want to. And I think you'll find that it helps you because you'll be able to hear with your ears what you say with your heart. And it will help you to stay focused. It has helped me to stay focused on my prayer. And I think there, there is a testimony of Scripture. And so pray out loud is the first point. Pray out loud. Find a way where you can pray out loud and even if it's just so that your can ears hear it, you know, you put all the pillows, if you're in a room and other people are around, put all the pillows over you and then pray underneath the pillows so nobody else can hear it, but you can hear your ears, you can hear it. Hey, you'll, I think you'll find it to be a helpful experience. Now, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Here we have also on the Sermon on the Mount, right before Jesus gave his, uh, the Lord's Prayer. This is um, the counsel that God gives us here on prayer. Matthew chapter 6, 5, and 8. And so it says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love the sound, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of streets. Now, don't pray to be heard by others, like pray out loud so that others can hear you. If they hear you, hopefully they will be in so in awe inspired that they'll ask you to teach us to pray. <laughs> hopefully, right? <laughs> But don't pray so that you can be heard. At least that's what the, the hypocrites do. It's not necessarily prayed out loud to be, to be seen and heard, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. Now, what does, the, what does your King James Version say? Go into your closet. Now, I don't know, I was thinking about that, and back in the Bible times, they, <laughs> many of the houses were just one-roomed one, one homes. <laughs> flat, flat roof and one room, and it was, you know, I mean, I don't know if they had closets <laughs> back in those days, like we do dad. And most of us can't get in our closets. They're stuffed. <laughs> but Jesus is, is giving us instruction here that when we have a, you know, some people say we should pray everywhere all the time, right? But I think it's true that you can't pray everywhere until you've prayed somewhere. We need to have a special place that we can go to pray. And it should be someplace where it's, where it's distraction-free. It's you and God. It's a closet. And maybe some of you need to get in the closet. <laughs> In the dormitory, it's hard to find a distraction-free free place to pray. Maybe it's in a corner where you can kind of just huddle down there and you can say, this is my little spot where you can pray out loud. Nobody's going to hear you, and, but you can pray to God. And that's what Jesus said we should have. We should go into our closet. We have a special place where we can actually talk to God. And then it says this, um, that you go into your room, and when you have shut the door... 
That's the idea is that nobody else is going to hear you and you're going to pray right to God, but God can hear you and your own ears can hear you. You can pray and nobody can hear you. There wouldn't be a necessity to go somewhere and pray if you're not praying out loud, would there? If you're just praying yourself, you, can, you wouldn't have to shut the door. So I think the implication again is here as he's praying, is, is praying out loud. And then it says this, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And um, we find that to be very, I found that to be helpful. So pray in, um, in secret, where, it's, where you're, you're, you're one with God, and you will find that you'll get power. Everybody knows what this button is. It's the power button, right? It's the power button, and it gives you power. Notice this. From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world and the Great Reformation. Martin Luther, Zwingli, uh, you, these great, the Wycliffe, the great men of, of, of the Reformation were men of prayer. And the Reformation never would have happened if it hadn't been for the secret place of prayer. I think it was um, Luther who said that he had so much to do that he had to spend three hours in prayer. Normally he spent two hours, but some days he had so much to do he had to spend three hours in prayer. <laughs> if that was anything truly his experience, you can see why this was true. And God is going to have a reformation at the end of time. Is it going to be based in prayer? It is. Do we need a deeper experience? Do I need a deeper? I do. And I want that this year. I want this year in my life to be a spirit of prayer. You remember Joshua? He said this mighty, mighty prayer. And if you looked at mighty prayers, bold prayers in the Bible, I think this has to be one of the greatest ones because he's fighting against the, the, um, the Gib fighting for the Gibeonites against the, the um, it's not the Amorites, was it? Is it the Amorites? Are you sending that? Amalekites. It was the Amalekites. He's fighting against his nations of all these other cities that had come up against Israel. And he goes to help the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites actually say, look, the Am Amalekites have come up against us. Why don't you come? We have this league with you now. Come and fight us. Even though they had lied, Joshua says, okay, I'm coming up. And he comes up there and he's, they're getting vengeance on their enemies. And finally, Joshua says, sun stands still in Gibeon and moon over the valley of Agilon. I mean, talk about a prayer. I mean... It's either going to happen or be real or not. <laughs> I mean, this is no joke. You go out and try that tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> true. And it stood there for a whole day. The lost day in history. I mean, about a, a span of a whole day, it stood still. Can you imagine now the terror on the rest of the, 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 the Canaanites? <laughs> I mean, even God, even they all sat at the, the sun never set today. Because one man said, moon stands still. Now, how did he have the courage and faith to be able to do that? Notice how he got it. The Spirit of God inspired Joshua's prayer. That evidence might again be given to the power of Israel's God, who was lifted up and exalted by that experience. It was God, God was. Hence, the request did not show presumption on the part of the great leader. Joshua had received the promise that God would surely overthrow those enemies of Israel, yet he put forth his earnest effort as though success depended upon the armies of Israel alone. So they had fought hard all day. They had done their best. And when they were out of everything that they could do, he knew that God was going to do something. And in faith, he gave one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. But notice where it came from. He did all that human energy could do. And then he cried in faith the divine aid. The secret of success in the union of divine power with human effort. Those who achieve the greatest results are those who are most Im implicitly up, rely most implicitly upon the almighty arm. The man who commanded the sun stand still upon Gibeon and moon in the valley of Agilon is the man who for hours lay prostrate on the earth in prayer in the camp of Gilgal. The men of prayer are men of? Where did he get the courage to say, sun stand still? He spent hours in prayer in Gilgal. He had a walk with God. He knew God. And when the hour came, he knew that God was going to fulfill his word. That's the only way we can have courage and power is to be men and women 
of prayer. It was in, and this is my, the last thing, young people. You know, um, it is possible as we started to come to Washita Hills, to be here. You know, you have Bible class, you have worship, we have assembly, we have prayer meeting, we have... If you add up all of the spiritual food that a person can receive in one week at Washita Hills, it's a huge smorgasbord. I mean, there's lots of it. But I know it is possible to live at a place like this, and yet still, at the end, Jesus can say, I don't know you. At least that's the real possibility according to Scripture. And so what does it take to have something more than just, oh, I've gone through the motions, but I've never really met Jesus for myself. I never had a real walk. I didn't have a deep prayer life. with. What does it take? We can put tools together, but what does it take? And, and I want to encourage you this year, young people, because unless you find for yourself and experience for yourself something that is real and vivid with God, everything else really is dangerous ground. Because the more we know, the more we are accountable. But if it doesn't transfer into our experience within a walk with God, then we are worse off than if we hadn't ever come here. Do you think that's possible? I think it is. Notice this quotation from Book Education. It was in the hours of solitary prayer that Jesus in his earthly life received wisdom and power. Let the youth follow his example in finding at dawn and twilight a quiet season for communion with their Father in heaven. And throughout the day, let them lift up their hearts to God. At every step of our way, he says, I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Fear not, I will help thee in your classes, in your ways. This constant prayer, if we pray somewhere, we can pray everywhere. And then it says this, could our children learn these lessons in the morning of their years what freshness and power, what joy and sweetness would be brought into their lives. Do you want that? It can happen. It can. And we can experience that this year. But it takes more than just a casual, oh, yeah, I've got to say my prayers. Oh, I've got to have my devotions in the morning. That's one of the, <laughs> that's one of the smorgaborgs. And you have to, right? You've got to get up. Let's see what I'm going to read today. Oh, good. I'm going to go on to my math. I put in my time. Oh, what a sadness to come to the end of and to have Jesus say, I never knew you. You didn't spend time with me. You weren't seeking me. You were seeking everything but me. And we can miss out unless we seek for ourselves. But what a joy and freshness will come when Jesus says something to our hearts and he actually speaks to us and we have something fresh to share. I mean, hearing the stories of Jim Castor were wonderful, wasn't it? Inspirational. Like, wow. God does amazing things for him. What about me? The least blessing that we ourselves have received from God is more or better than all the accounts we can read of faith in the life of others. The least blessing. If you spend time with God and He speaks to your heart, oh, what a freshness, what a joy, what a privilege. And He wants to speak to your heart. He wants to speak to my heart. How many tonight want to say, I want power, Lord. I want the greatest blessing that you can give. And I want to seek it this year. Not just casually. I don't want to just get up in the morning and, get a, and go through the forms and say a short prayer. But that 30 minutes you have to spend, try spending all 30 minutes in prayer. Out loud to your ears. Now you need other things. There's other tools and there's other things that can help you. And I thought, you know, maybe we should have 
you know how they have a 3BN interview and they sit around, they talk about things and they interact. I was like, maybe we should have an interview with various people and, and about their Christian life and especially about their prayer life. What do you do and how do you do it? Give us examples so that we can have practical tips in our lives of what they do and see how it works because prayer can be taught, but so often it's not. At least in real practical, tangible ways, what do we pray for and how do we pray? And we got some instructions with Jim Castor on, you know, the four steps of prayer, the four categories of prayer, praise, and what are they? Thanks, prayer. That one's last. Confession, supplication. supplication, and thanksgiving, right? Praise and the four, three things. But then there's other ways. There's other things that you can do. Use the, there's the sanctuary model, and there's the, uh, there's the, uh, the um, Lord's Prayer model. There's apps. Acts, A-C-T-S, Acts. And there are apps too. In fact, I downloaded one because I was like, there's, there's apps out there on how to pray and that, that actually can, you can put in things and it will prompt you about praying. You need to pray for so-and-so and you can, you can put, I prayed for them. And the, the next one on your prayer list pops up and you can pray for them and then open oh, the next one, you can pray for them so that you can ha remind things. And, you know, trying to find out why to study in prayer in the Bible. And the, Jesus, he didn't spend a lot of time in his active ministry reading this, although he was a man of God and God's word, and he was the word, but he spent hours in prayer. And how I need that, and I want that, and I hope you do too. That's just the message tonight. It's just a message about prayer, that we need it more, and if we do, we'll have power, and it will be the greatest blessing God can give you. And if you pray with your ears, your, your, your voice and your ears here, I think it'll help you. It'll help you stay focused. It'll help distract and you don't have to worry about the devil. And to pray in a secret place where you can find a spot where you can get along with God where nobody else can hear and you can actually pray out loud, I think that will help you. And I want to encourage you to try to do that this, this year. And then we can say at the end of the year, that was a year of prayer. It began with Jim Castor maybe there. and It was like none other because we are seeking God's face in prayer. And that's what I want. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much that uh, you're a prayer hearing God and you give us that greater, greatest blessing of communion with you. And it's, it's not that the act of prayer itself is the greatest blessing, but it's the blessing that we receive by communing with you, where you speak to our hearts. We need that. Oh, what a joy, a freshness in our religious life will be brought in the youth of our years, in the morning of our years, if we would learn that as a young person, that we could experience all our life. I want to pray that you would send your spirit to bless us this year. We want to seek your face. And we need a deeper experience. I need a deeper experience in prayer. And I want to pray that you would teach us to pray and give us that power that can shake the world as it did in the Reformation is our prayer. In Jesus' name.